Hello, everyone. It's your girl, Chelsea Fagan, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet and person who just loves talking about money, back with an all-new episode of The Financial Confessions. But before we get started, I wanted to thank Avast for supporting today's episode of The Financial Confessions. Avast's new all-in-one solution, Avast One, helps you take control of your safety and your privacy online. Learn more about Avast One at avast.com. And today is a very exciting milestone for TFC because we have in studio our first ever, first ever, first ever, three-time guest. He's been on season one. Then we had him again on season two. A lot of you guys were big fans of that one, particularly because it came at what I believe to have been the bleakest moment of the past couple of years. Uh, to set the stage for his appearance on season two, it was uh, May of 2020. We were 10 feet apart in a room here at the TFD office. Um, my husband was out of the country for an indefinite period of time. New York City was um, bleak and you know, many tales were being told of its uh, inevitable decline into uh, Mad Max beyond Thunderdome. Um, and it was just a dark, dark time. But uh, we got together, uh, my guest and I today, and we talked all about the ways in which the world of aspiration and influencers and social media and all of these things were changing in light of a world where we really honestly couldn't do all that much aspirational stuff. Uh, in the two years since, a lot has changed for the better and for the worse. Um, but one thing has remained the same, and that is that our guest today is one of my dearest friends. He is writer, tech journalist, purveyor of fantastic articles and video essays on all kinds of fraudsters, and just generally all around really cool person to talk to, my dear friend, Ryan. Hello. Welcome back. I'm so happy to be here. Oh my God, we're excited to have you and excited to have you in, uh, as I mentioned in the intro, uh, a slightly better time for us all. <laughs> yeah, slightly. Ever so slightly. <laughs> um, welcome. For those who may not be familiar with your oeuvre here on the Financial Confessions, uh, who are you? I am, uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I've had many lives. I've worked in many a job. I've worked in TV. I've been a writer. I've been an editor at a magazine. Um, I've, I've, I do drag. I, I, I've done live comedy events. Um, I've been a real housewife. You know, not, not a real real housewife, but a fake real housewife. Um, and uh, now uh, I guess I'm just Chelsea's friend hanging out. Hanging out. <laughs> um, and what is particularly exciting about having Ryan with us today is, as I mentioned, he is launching his own YouTube channel after many years making truly fabulous video essays for other people. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But he's also going to be doing uh, one of the most exciting things that we're doing here at TFD a little bit later in the year. We're launching a marquee podcast. It's Deep Dive Podcast, co-hosted by Ryan and another uh, personal finance friend of ours to be revealed. It's called Too Good to Be True. And what is it going to be, Ryan? It is going to be about the uh, financial scams and the uh, con artists that will dot your financial future and try their best to break their way into your uh, your uh, financial habits. We're talking MLMs. We're talking crystals. We're talking Ponzi schemes. Ponzi schemes. We're talking housewives. We're talking a lot of things. Yeah. It's going to be really exciting. Um, so you guys will be hearing more about that uh, in the next few months here at TFD, but that's one of the things we're super excited about. And since so much of what Ryan covers uh, in his own work and what he's going to be covering with us is sort of all about the duplicitous and fraudulent world of financial scams, especially as they pertain to more public figures. I thought nothing better to talk about than the overarching concept of financial scams because with all of the adapted for TV series we have out right now, it kind of sometimes feels like we're in a golden age of scams. Between the scams and the cults and the murders, we're having a rough one out here in the nonfiction land. Um, but yeah, no, it is the golden age for for scams. We've I, I honestly think since like I would say like 2014, 2015 is when that trend began. And now we're out here. Uh, people are straight up just telling other people that they're con artists and people love it. They'll cheer them on. I well, think it was in the post today that they want Anna Delvey in uh, Real Housewives. So I hate that my first reaction is kind of, I would like to see it. <laughs> That She's is, qualified. I mean, sure is. Uh, but that's the thing, right? So, okay. So right now, let's name them. So we got... Uh, just right now on TV, we have We Crashed, we have The Dropout, we have Inventing Anna, we have, what else do we have? There was the Beanie Baby one that was on Amazon. That one was pretty good. There was Bad Vegan. Yes. There's, there's been Lula Rich. Lula Rich. There's and the, the Eyes of Tammy Faye, which is about her husband sort of being a con artist and her... 
Yeah. And then we pivot over to reality. We have Jen Shaw. We have Erica Jane. Yes, we do. <laughs> we have so many. And the, the thing about all of these people, so like, okay, so you have the housewives. They have been, I mean, Jen Shaw's probably going to prison. That girl's still on the show. Yes. And we're still loving her. We have We Crashed that is all about how just unbelievably toxic and manipulative and, and fraudulent the business was. And you can, and my husband has a membership to WeWork right now. <laughs> that man is at a WeWork as we speak. An American institution. <laughs> But it's just the the degree to which we feel sort of culturally fascinated with these scams and the degree to which they're being exposed feels like it's at warp speed. And yet the consequences have never felt less severe. Yeah, I mean, I think people, there's an aspirational quality to, there's a power fantasy part of it too, right? Like we all want to see rich aspirational people on TV sometimes. And we want the power fantasy of like, what if I just did whatever I wanted? What if everybody had to like, what if everybody fell for my thing? And you watch it and you're, there is an, a level of like feeling clever. Like when you watch Catch Me If You Can, for example, that's a movie where it's the fun of it is to watch how inventive he can be. But I think in we're living now in a world of like capitalism and celebrity where it's you're so incentivized to have stuff like that to show off that you know those extractive the extractive financials of it all are, are seem so I, I i guess it seems like the one way out for a lot of people because it seems like if you play the game fair you're not gonna win so you might as well cheat and then you know if the cheater is charming you're like Haha, look at that guy well, I mean, you're tapping into probably what is the one of the bigger scams going right now at scale, which is cryptocurrencies and NFTs, yeah. which are fundamentally sort of predicated on this uh, idea that the old system cannot and will not work for you. So you might as well take a gamble with this new system, no matter how dubious it might be. Yeah. And, I, and there, I, you, the, a lot of the arguments for cryptocurrencies are like, well, look how the look at the wealth redistribution. So and so made so much money so quickly. People made a lot of money in, in pyramid schemes. <laughs> like, uh, sure did. And they still are. And they still are. Um, people have made a lot of money in Ponzi schemes. Um, it, You know, I think when we're in a, such a bleak reality, I think people want to see other people succeed and they don't want to resent success and they want to cheer on people for doing well. And I think there's also like a whole personal responsibility angle where it's like, if you get tricked, that's your fault. And it's like, I actually don't think that is your fault. I think it's the fault of someone that tricked you, right? Like morally, that person's culpable, not you. Well, one of, so one of my favorite video essays that you made that I've showed to everyone um, is a video essay. It's sort of, you know, video essay, I think is often a very editorial medium here on YouTube. And this is actually a lot more journalistic. Like you were actually sitting uh, in the room with him and uh, got a lot of sort of original original material for it. Uh, but you did a video exposing Tyler Henry, the boy psychic, yeah. um, the Hollywood medium. <laughs> they both jumped psychic. up with the air quotes. Uh, for those who don't know, this is a guy who has a show on E! where he pretends not to have any awareness of the very, very famous people that he's doing psychic readings it's on. A very young gay guy who like, Former is Mormon. like, I've never heard of reality TV. What are movies? And then he'll run into Snooki and know every fact about her. This is amazing. This is uh, amazing ability. He has this, yeah, it's, I mean, even as far as psychics go, and you do address in your video a lot of sort of the Barnum effect and the cold readings and how these things are really done to make it seem as though these people have knowledge. But even beyond the normal ability to say vague things about people's lives and have them resonate, like he's interviewing people for whom all of this information is readily available, in many cases in their own memoirs. And so you did this video that I think was incredibly effective at kind of dismantling the whole thing and even co sort of cornered him on the fact that he wouldn't give you a reading, which <laughs> I wonder why. Um, <laughs> and if you read it, there's also an accompanying piece that should still be up, even though the outline is now rest in peace. Um, <laughs> if you Google the piece, there's a larger piece with, 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 with a lot of the facts like linked and laid out. And um, it's, it's kind of wild. Like I sat with him and said like, can I have a reading? No. Why not? Well, I'm not ready to. Oh, okay. Well, would, would, W w could we do a validation study? Like, pick a day, pick a time, pick a place. You come up with the test. Let's do it. No. Interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. interesting. Okay. But so you make if I had magical powers, I'd be using them left and right. Uh, no kidding. <laughs> um, but so you make this video. It's got in the millions of views, the article similar. And yet it doesn't even make a dent. In nope. That. He has a Netflix special. He has a Netflix special. Yeah. 
what did what is your feeling on that with with him specifically given how far you went to sort of break it down i have learned my lesson about trying to correct people with facts or figures or even research like i i do it and i will present it to the willing parties but there are people who are not in good faith reading the piece they do not want to believe anything you say that is against him because they or any psychic or any con artist because they really need it to be true they need this to be true it's the same thing when you talk to people who are in pyramid schemes i have a family member who's been in deep in a pyramid scheme for a long time and um you 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 can try your hardest to talk them down you can point out you can show them videos you can break give them resources but ultimately emotionally they want to believe that it's all going to work out and that they'll they're a they're a business babe and they're at the top of their game and anybody who's talking otherwise is jealous or not working hard enough and you can emotionally believe any and i i'm that's kind of how i'm right now feeling about politics and economics which is just like if you want the information, I am so excited to give it to you. If you don't, well, I guess we'll see where that gets us. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of it with psychics, especially, Henry especially, is it's so emotional. I mean, if, if you lost someone and you felt this was the only way you could ever speak to them again, you're not going to take that in, right? Like You can't. You have to. You have to believe. Well, it's interesting you mention like a, a loved one being deep into an MLM. Um, and man, I had a family member who was very close to getting into this insane one where you have to buy a $5,000 water filtration system to get involved. Oh, I've heard about the water filtration system. Don't worry. And I swear to God, I was <laughs> same, like, same family member. I felt like freaking Gandalf and the Balrog. I was like, Pulling her out of the bed. I was like, don't you dare buy that water filtration system. And she didn't. But it could have gone either way, right? Like, yeah. I could have a family member, like, 10,000 plus, like, five figures in debt on this MLM. And you mentioned, you know, having a loved one doing that. And when you look at, like, a lot of these um, scandals and scams, MLMs being another example. And this is something I've gotten a little bit of pushback on saying in the past in terms of you see the con artist at the top, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's like a whole subsection of people who are at once probably victim, but also perpetrator. It, it's a lot like a cult where, you know, you everyone involved besides the person at the top, obviously, everyone involved is a little bit the bad guy and a little bit the victim. And it's tough because you... It's so hard to pick apart, you know, and especially those people probably, probably those people do go through an enormous amount of trauma and it me it mixes those worlds. And at some point, I think part of them doesn't care. Part At least I can say from my personal experience, the people that I know who are in pyramid schemes, at some point they don't care if they're a good person or a bad person. It just needs to work out. Like right. this needs to end well. This has to, I have to prove it. We have to come to some good conclusion because if not, what does it say about you? You know, and I, I, I it's hard because you can contend with it on every level, but ultimately it's an emotional decision that people are making. And um, I don't want to say people choose to be a victim, but if you are a if you are perpetrating harm against people regularly and also having that harm perpetrated on you and you're in that cycle, you are you have to at some level be aware that what's happening is a vicious cycle because it just keeps repeating. Right. Like and. I think it's it's different too with a with a with a an MLM because there are paper trails everywhere. It's not like oh I just believe in aliens, right? right. Like, it's like you can clearly see the numbers are not going in your or anyone at the bottom's favor, and that should give you pause, right? Like, but I think again, if you take doesn't. it if you take it back to like the crypto and NFT stuff, like there, I mean, for me again, and listen, I guess I'm just gonna be bringing this video up every day now on TFD. But Dan Olson's seminal video, the problem Incredible. with NFTs, it is hard for me to understand how anyone could watch that and not walk away thinking, well, hard to argue with that, right? Like it's it's right, but I do feel like there's that. So there's that effect, that psychological effect from uh, what is this? Uh, it's a psychologist wrote a book, I believe, in the 1970s or late 60s following a cult, um, and it was called When Prophecy Fails. Um, mm -hmm. And it was about a doomsday cult that was, you know, essentially betting big on the world ending at a very specific date, which they rarely commit to because of how easily it can be disproven. But Or just reschedule. A lot of them will just be like, hey, I looked at the runes, ends up it was September, <laughs> so I'll see you guys in nine months. You know, like I rearranged the crystals. Um, <laughs> 
But so it didn't happen. Uh, yeah. But the cult, not only the members didn't just become more committed, the cult actually grew after that happened. Um, I think it's Leon Fessinger is the name of the psychologist who wrote that. But either way, it's hard not to look at what's happening with, you know, things like NFTs and crypto and, and these MLMs and see a little bit the same phenomenon. I mean, it's interesting, right? Because people will point at crypto and they'll be like, but the line keeps going up. Like the numbers are going up. I'm fine with it. And it's well, who controls the numbers and for how long will those go up? And um, I think, especially with something like you were saying, like a, like a cult where the doomsday thing doesn't come true, it, it becomes its own cost fallacy where you're like, I've put so much into this, right. I might as well keep going. <laughs> but that's very much not true. It's like when you watch a TV show and you watch two seasons, you're like, there's eight seasons and I don't like this show, so... Two seasons in, guess we're starting season three. Like, you don't have to do that. You don't have to finish it. You can walk away at any time. But if if you tell everybody the world's going to end and it doesn't end, and then you've got, like, some corrective number or whatever, if anything, it might make you even more of a zealot to be like, well, I know I'm right this time, you know? People don't want to be wrong. The sun, cal- the sun cost fallacy is my exact relationship with the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Every, <laughs> every season, it's been like six seasons that that show is not good. And no. every season I'm like, if I've come this far, maybe this time it will be different. I had to have a talking to with myself about Vanderpump Rules about the same thing. Oh, no. I've still never seen it. First Man. two seasons, classic reality TV. I mean, you can't get any better than that. Talk about scams and con artists. Well, that brings me to... Uh, the Real Housewives question. So yes. we've we've now, I mean, for those of us who are fans of not just the Real Housewives, but of reality TV in general, and listen, if any of you in the comments are going to be like, I don't come here to listen about Real Housewives, goodbye. Leave the show now. <laughs> um, for those of us who, who do watch it uh, and are kind of compelled by it, to see the sort of Ouroboros of how the women's, you know, drive to have this aspirational life has caused one after the other after the other to engage in all kinds of levels of fraud and scammery. And I mean, we have the Erica Janes and the Jen Shaws, but also if you look at their cast, several of the other people involved in MLMs, being sued by former employees, like all kinds of incredibly fraudulent behavior. And now it seems like, although occasionally you'll see consequences here and there, it's almost become something that makes the cast member even more bankable. Yeah, I mean, it makes you, I, I think Jen Shaw's the perfect example of like, well, I guess infamy is better than not being famous to her. And it makes you, it gives you a built-in storyline and all this stuff, but it also, I think a lot of white collar crime is completely ignored and these are people for whom, like, they refuse for no no part of their life will be ignored. They, like, they're they going to post it. They're going to put it on Bravo. They're going to talk about it on camera. And, you know, some, some people put themselves out there that, especially, I think a lot of the time you see the house husbands look a little, like, squicky. Like, are you sure we're going to be on camera doing this, Teresa? You know what I mean? Like, really? We're going to... Um, but I think some of the worst behavior isn't the headline makers. We got Teresa. I forgot the two that have been to jail for a collective five years. Yeah. Continue. Um, it's, I think some of the ones that don't actually end up making headlines have done some of the worst stuff. But it's just expected for a certain uh, – it's becoming expected, I think, culturally in this country for a certain class of people to be breaking the rules or bending the rules or um, at least just doing tax fraud as like the basic of – Uh, the basic creative accounting or the basics of being a real housewife. But it's also, it's a self-selecting group of people, right? Like you have this group of people that want to be on TV and have everything that they do either mocked or praised or taken apart. Um, They're willing to subject their entire personal lives, generally their children, their marriages, anything going wrong in their marriages, relationships with their parents. They're willing to give it all up to the audience in order to be seen and to have um, a level of fame and a level of... um, of uh, fandom and like response on social. Um, And these are people who, you know, you can become famous a variety of ways, but these are people who the Just Add Water fame was enough for them. Um, And and that's not judging people. You know, I think uh, there's a lot of reality stars I think are great and do great work and that I think are really nice people, but it is a self-selecting group. And I think you're going to find in that group of people, people who are, you know, thrilled for a shortcut or people for who their scruples are uh, are un. Because, <laughs> because there's a lot of behavior you're also going to be asked to do by producers to people that you like or friends you've just made or people who are vulnerable. But, you know, it makes for good TV. It makes for drama. It makes for discussion and water cooler moments. And if you're down to do all of that, you're probably down 
for a lot of stuff in life. And and I don't, you know, again, I don't want to besmirch the name of every real housewife. There are lots of nice ones. Uh, it's just that the scammers, you know, a couple bad apples spoils the, uh, spoils the bunch. But uh, there are some real housewives for whom, like, I mean, I love Kyle Richards. I think Kathy mm. Hilton is very funny on that show. However, you look into the Hilton family and there is a lot of interesting some interesting financials. Have you read House of Hilton? Yes, I have read House of Hilton. What All I right. was referring to specifically, but I didn't want to get down in the muck right away. <laughs> T- TFD Book Club, House Please of Hilton. Please read House of Hilton. Read to yourself. There is so much happening. But you know what's interesting? You mentioned how some of the ones that get the least press are doing the worst stuff. And I have to say the one that I find to be the most compelling in that regard is Teddy Mellencamp. Oh, because my gosh. Because she's very disliked in the fandom, for those who are not familiar. But... Uh, for what I consider to be the most superficial reasons, they're like, she's boring. She's annoying. Here's what Teddy Mellencamp does as her actual job. She has an MLM mm-hmm. where the product is berating clients by text message to eat less than 500 calories a day so that they lose weight. You pay thousands of dollars for thousands this Thousands of dollars for it. You get and bullied and, and everything that you do is is picked apart or criticized and, and you're encouraged through like motivational insults. To build yourself your own eating disorder. Um, you are. Which I think is fair if you look at the actual amount of calories oh. you're eating. Very much disordered eating. We'll link you to a great expose on this by a nutritionist, but is it nutritionist or dietitian that's the certified one? Um, a dietitian is certified. We'll, we'll link you to a really great breakdown of, of this by an actual dietitian. But uh, suffice to say, this is a program where like you move up in the ranks, you become a coach, you do all of the sort of like very typical MLM structure stuff. But unlike, you know, yoga pants or essential oils, you're having women, mostly women, beneath you send pictures of the scale every day uh, and report into you about when they, you know, broke down and had an Oreo and you berate them. And that for whatever reasons, despite being fairly open knowledge, and again, a business that's being marketed actively and openly has never crested. So my question is for you, what do you think separates the scams that do really sort of break out and the ones that go ignored? It's tough because it's like, who do people listen to? Um, you know, it, 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 people come out of the woodwork when someone gets on reality TV and they'll they'll t- say gossip of stories or whatever about how this person's a- a horrible and X, Y, Z. Um, And most of it goes ignored. Uh, But what I thought was really interesting was that Teddy Mellencamp was on TV at the same time that Nexium documentary was airing on HBO that was explaining how Nexium basically functioned exactly like Teddy Mellencamp's all in um, MLM business. Um, And I thought the reason that that was getting attention and, and Teddy's didn't was that it had an upper level girl boss type white woman who was willing to turn on the organization and spill their secrets and tell everything that went on and verify stories that had come out. But Teddy hasn't had that yet. She's kept, you know, her teams on lock. There hasn't been anybody to come out and be the whistleblower who people believe or find credible. Because if you come out and you're, if you come out of her system, right, and you don't look the way that Teddy looks, she can say, well, you failed and you're a complainer and you just want your money back, but it's not my fault you failed the program. But if the program's incredibly abusive, abusive and doesn't work, you know, it's it's a catch-22. And and so what, what you, uh, the producer is going to fight with her and try to keep her on the show despite trying to expose her. You have that push-pull like you had with Mary. Uh, Mary, Mary Cosby would, of Salt Lake Speaking City. of cults, um, <laughs> she runs a church that believes she is uh, an effigy of God, I think is how she ended up wording it. She's some form of a deity and deserves to be praised and worshipped. And she also owns a... a, a married com- to her grandfather. Married to her grandfather, we should say. Um, her <laughs> actual, her, her step-grandfather, who, who's step. the only grandfather she ever knew who raised her. Um and uh, and and she owns a, a company that will refinance your mortgage in case you want to donate to her church and don't have any cash on hand, uh, which is just such an interesting thing for for the first lady of a church to run. Um, and man, did Andy Cohen make a deal with the devil when he went to Salt Lake City because she's like the third most scandalous person on that show. Far. And and what's interesting is that the minute that it began being brought up on the show, she ran because they they finally they brought in somebody to to finally start spilling some of her secrets and um, he passed away. And so they didn't have any way to really nail her down at the reunion or anywhere else. And she knew the producers were onto her and wanted to like maybe play out the storyline of like, what is her church really like? And she ran for the hills. And I think 
they now know that unless it comes out in the public involuntarily and they decide to use the show to like get people to like them or to try to fix the scam you see that a lot like Jen Shaw is a perfect example where she's 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 trying to use marketing speak and the existence of fake Facebook to make excuses for like spear phishing old and vulnerable people into credit card scams, which it's like, man, you know. Well, the Mary Cosby thing. So I have actually I've developed a theory on these scams over the years, especially as they pertain to public figures who otherwise have the means to pay for aggressive lawyers and, you know, to spin a PR narrative. I have a feeling that when they really tuck tail and run, a la Mary Cosby, that's when we're getting into tax fraud. That's when we're, because generally speaking, if you are a rich, powerful, privileged white person, one of the very few things that will actually send you to prison is tax fraud. Yeah, don't mess with the IRS. Don't mess with the IRS. They get their cut. Um, And I think historically, like, for example, what ultimately got, you know, Teresa and Joe Judice in jail was in large part tax fraud. Um, And so I have a feeling that, you know, maybe, for example, Teddy Mellencamp's business is an affront to humanity, but it's probably filing its taxes correctly and probably categorized directly, whereas Mary Cosby's church having people refinance in order to give her money is probably playing around with the taxes. Yeah, and it's interesting too, right, because there are certain organizations which have been deemed untouchable, uh, even by the IRS. You know, you look at your Scientologies and and, and even Nexium got away with it for a long time. But what's, what's interesting to me is that the existence of something like that means that everybody thinks they're the exception. And so a lot of these people end up on TV because they think, you know, it's never going to happen to me. I've clearly been so good at this. I'm a genius. And now they want me on reality TV. I couldn't, I I couldn't fail. You know, I'm a charmer. Um, And I think you, when they tuck tail and run, you're right. I think that that's when they realize that like, maybe, maybe this might catch up with me and I'd rather keep the money than the fame, which I mean, maybe that speaks to their character. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I mean, maybe it does. But on the subject of protecting yourself against all kind of nefarious behavior, especially while online, I want to take a second to thank today's sponsor, Avast. As a digital first media company, and as you can tell from today's episode, digital safety is incredibly necessary in all forms and is something very important to us here at TFD. Today's sponsor, Avast, has been a global leader in cybersecurity for more than 30 years and is trusted by over 435 million users. Avast empowers you with digital safety and privacy no matter who you are, where you are, how you connect, or your budget. Avast One offers both free and premium options. Learn more about Avast One at avast.com. And just to highlight a few of their amazing features, they of course have antivirus software, which is award-winning and helps you stop viruses and malware from harming your devices. They also have SmartScan, which will find and remove viruses already present and resolve the most common privacy and performance issues through an optimization scam, something we have to use frequently here at TFD, because you never know what's hanging out on that internet you're on. Avast prevents over 1.5 billion attacks every month, and with Avast One, you can confidently take control of your digital presence without worrying about viruses, phishing attacks, ransomware, hacking attempts, and other cyber crimes. Learn more about Avast One at Avast.com. And now let's get back to our juicy chat with Ryan. Okay, you mentioned it a couple times. We gotta go there. Uh, Nixium. Oh, man. Now, now, I will say... You mean Scientology with the label scratched off and quickly (laughs) replaced with like a metallic sharpie of something else? Yeah. Well, what truly blew my mind about the Nixium thing was two things. One was how- The volleyball. No. <laughs> Keith, that, okay, I swear to God, when we talk about living rent-free in our heads, the scene where Keith Rainier meets Allison Mack and he's in that disgusting sweatband and she's like, cannot- It she's takes everything herself. in my ethical soul not to do a live show where we just, I just perform that as like a one man, Wait. one woman, like- <laughs> Uh, note to self, future show here, uh, comedy clubs. Um, so th- the two things that really jumped out at me about the whole Nexium story, and to be honest, again, we did actually have some real consequences on the part of Keith Rainier and Allison Mack. We love to see it. Um, but what jumped out when it was really trending was that A, very few people were talking about the fact that it was very fundamentally at its core in MLM. Yes. What struck me when we were watching at least the first one, the the HBO series, The Vow, which came out, made a huge, huge splash, um, aside from the MLM factor, was that, you know, we were following two of the very, very high up members, which if you look at a typical MLM structure, like, 
I'm sorry, we can debate all we want about the degree to which people who are actively recruiting others in MLM schemes are culpable, but there is a small cabal at the top, all those should be in jail. And what was unbelievable about the vow is that they were able to, narr to, to narrate the story as protagonists. And later in other Nexium shows, you did get a much more critical view of the two narrators, but that, the degree to which people were taking them on as sympathetic storytellers, despite the obviously terrible stuff they were doing. I mean, and continuing top, to live with the wealth they gained from via the scam. Reported live from their glamorous Vancouver townhomes. I mean, they were like, why aren't we on the front page of the New York Times while sitting in like glass and chrome encrusted tower in the sky? And it was a little tough because they had been burning people, <laughs> like branding them. Burning them literally. So as a former t you know, TV producer and someone who's worked in TV, do you think that was just a question of them giving unprecedented access to the producers of the show? Or do you think that that was more a storytelling choice? I think that they were so used to being filmed at that point because Nexium was one of those cults um, similar to the family or the, like the source family where the filming was like part of it. The documentation is part of the cult. And I think that they were just at some point, and I, this, this is also true of reality TV, um, you f lose an awareness of being captured and that everything you're doing is being documented. And you can tell yourself a story of they'll lose it in editing. You know, they'll, they'll fix that. Oh, it might have come off that, but they, they know I mean well. But, you know, I, some people don't mean well. And I think it's, you know, with Nexium especially, we don't really talk as much about, and we should talk more about the ways that Silicon Valley and like wellness, self-help culture set the stage for them. Mm. And, you know, uh, Silicon Valley is, is uh, it's a place with a lot of, of high goals that necessarily you can't prove. I mean, you look at the Theranos case and that's someone who, because the science is complicated and th those companies are by nature secretive, you're able to keep a, a, a scam, a, a complete fraud going as long as, as, as possible with people at the top, VCs, um, completely in on it. When it comes to a cult, when it comes to like, um, the, the difference between a company that's taking a ton of money and, and not actually producing a product um, and a cult is that at a, with a cult, it's behavioral and it all has to play out between the members, right? Like they're all culpable because they're doing this stuff to each other. In, in Scientology, the people auditing, the people recording your secrets and doing blackmail, calling each other squirrels and running around are all Scientologists. You can't, it can't, you can't be shielded from it. Some of the people that worked at Theranos were in the lab and they worked on like, you know, the paint that went on the outside of the device. They had no idea that the device itself didn't work. Um, but I think I think the difference between like a um, the next Nexium and say Scientology is that because Nexium came up in a uh, in an environment with uh, with the veneer of self-help and the veneer of of uh, self-care over it, they could do things like referrals and say like, well, we're just like Uber, bring in a friend and we'll give you whatever. It's not a pyramid scheme. We're not trying to get you to trap people. Um, we're just giving you a referral code or whatever. And they could, uh, <laughs> they could turn around and say that like any problems that you were, or things you were, whatever you weren't understanding about the business model. Um, and these people at the top had to have had that information. You know, it's, it's like, um, it's like uh, uh, Sarah is a perfect example of someone that understood how the business worked. She understood how the money worked and she had no problem with it until they had a problem with her. And it's different from, say, Mike on um, Leah Remini's Scientology in the Aftermath. Did you ever watch that? Mm -mm. That was a very different case because Mike had defected long before anyone had like caught him or, or named him or whatever. And he's made his life goal taking apart Scientology, not just you know getting famous for being a good person. Is he the Australian one? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I remember him and going clear. Yes, he excellent. He he led he he led the media campaign for Scientology. So then when he turned around, he was kind of uniquely able to then be a counter to them in the media because he knew their techniques and he knew what worked against them because it had worked against him. And he's now made it his life's work to take apart Scientology, um, which I haven't seen. You know, I'm sure she still is involved in it, but I haven't seen a lot of Sarah in the news or doing a whole lot. Um, and I think it, the difference is I, there's different personality types, but I also think the difference is when you when you put this veneer of self-care and this veneer of wellness on top of something as opposed to calling it a religion or whatever, you can say, well, there's a lot of good in there. You know, right, like right, we told right, you right. a lot of great self-help stuff that's in every self-help book. 
um, without, you know, talking about whether or not those self-help books are themselves at all helpful. Very true. And also you could just buy one for like 10 bucks. You don't have to like lose your life and get branded and pay tens of thousands of dollars and get trafficked. Anybody who's taking you to meetings regularly and charging you a lot of money for something that like should be available on Google or could be a YouTube video or in a slideshow doesn't want, isn't trying to be like expedient about it. Like, no. like if, if you want to have like a, a, you know, like if you want to go to a class, right, you should be taking notes, but those notes should be applicable even if, say, you didn't go to the class. You, it's not like a magical experience. You know what I mean? There's this there, there's this belief a lot of the times with MLMs that if you're not in the room getting hyped up, none of it matters, right? Mm. But it, it it actually should. Like if you if you go to college class, right, you sit down, you're, you're being instructed. It, it's not a hype session. You're not being convinced of what you're reading. You don't need someone there selling it to you. The information itself is what you're paying to see or whatever. Um, the difference is with an MLM or with or with any of these like self help cults um, that the part of the experience is the togetherness, is the group think, is the like learning to deny things together. Um, and I do believe at some level, I, you know, maybe the first six months you might have no idea, but at some level you know you're doing that to other people and that it was done to you. You have to. Of course you do. Well, well, and that's the thing that can be really, really infuriating. But, you know, one of the things that, you know, going back to the financial, the more overtly financial frauds, again, like cryptocurrency and MLM. So when we were initially starting to do some content on cryptocurrencies, I talked to my husband about it, who works in um, tech, specifically in cybersecurity, um, and is really familiar with all of this stuff and probably one of the most staunchly opposed people I've ever known in my in my life and when we were initially starting to approach it I think like a lot of people I was I had a very sort of like uh, naively neutral opinion on the subject like you know we'll you know teach people what they need to know to kind of navigate the the system and he was very adamant from day one if you're going to talk about these things you have to talk about them like an MLM you can't give people sort of a false sense of security or legitimacy with these things and you have to protect them and he said one thing about uh like NFTs for example um early on that kind of stuck with me where he said there's only two kinds of people in this there's marks and there's cons yeah. um and i was like okay but i'm sure i mean I, I know enough to know that there are a lot of true believers and he was like no true believers are marks he was like they're marks who maybe have a better vocabulary around the subject they're marks who maybe have more of a strong technical background or a strong financial background but if they're approaching this as uh like a any kind of financial instrument or an economic model they're marks still and very liable to being exploited exploited in ways similar to you know i mean look at all the hedge funds right now shorting a bunch of sh i mean there are people out there who are willing to take advantage of even the truest believers. So my question is, you know, in doing a lot of the content that you've done around these fraudsters and these scams, do you feel that there is that binary? Um, I do. I, and I think it's it's tough. Like right? you, you get say you get real estate, um, uh, business, behavioral science, tech and finance, extractive capitalism in a room, nobody good's coming out. However, I think there are people uniquely tricked into coming into the tent and, and they can be at every wealth level. But I, I have a family member who's super deep into crypto and I just have made super clear, like we don't play with the house money, you know, because <laughs> I don't know the line of, for him and I don't know the line for anybody, but I do know that like, I do know that at some point, even if you think you are a con, you might be a mark. And mm -hmm. if you, if you could be, especially if you're convinced that you are the one perpetuating and going to win in the end, even if this ends up be going belly up, who, who told you that? Right? <laughs> who was convincing you of that? Well, and I think another thing that crypto really benefits from that you see in so many of these frauds, like, uh, you know, the Theranos one being another great example is the number of people who have a sufficient level of subject matter expertise on all of the various components of the concept are so few. What shocks me is that people were turning their nose up at that Dan Olson video about NFTs because they were like, it's two hours long. I'm going to sit here and listen to this guy talk at a camera for two hours. And it's like, you're willing to put a significant amount of your wealth into an instrument that you won't listen to a two hour 
informational session about like but, but also with all of these various levels with all with the technical angle with you know the web three concept with economics the, with econ, with macro and microeconomics behavioral science i mean from psychology every angle. like i think two hours and 18 minutes is brief honestly yeah. that was a pretty quick that was a, like a like a pretty quick i feel like we went to you ever go to epcot and you go on ellen's energy adventure you spend about an hour where Ellen DeGeneres explains to you how oil and renewable energy works. It's sponsored by uh, Exxon, so it is itself a scam. <laughs> however, however, similar to that, it, it felt like in, in a short amount of time, he was able to give you a tour of all the problems without necessarily proving that they are problems without necessarily like belaboring the point. And if you could make it a half hour in and we're still like not either shocked and horrified and running away or like locked in for more info... Sometimes I think that we think that the that we think that the people falling for these scams have all of the resources that we do, both informationally, but also intellectually, academically, um, financially, financially, and they don't. And and a lot of scams position the 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 circus tent that they're they're getting you into to be pass, worth passing by for people who aren't going to be tricked, right? So like the emails are generally, email scams are generally misspelled and filled with grammatical errors and clear factual distortions because they want people who won't be put off by that right. to continue on. And it's the same thing with say like Nexium is uh, at the top, they make sure that when you're at a leadership con conference, that if they nag you, if they say stuff about men and women, that's clearly like a huge generalization and probably unhealthy. If you're not going to walk out on that, well, then we've got some finance stuff to tell you about, too, on the other end of this. And it is, it is, um, you know, I, I think NFTs and crypto, they make people feel a certain way. It's like, come in the door and you'll all be an investor. You're a, you're a banker now. You're a hot shot stock market, Silicon Valley. Like, you're Mark Zuckerberg. You're, all the, you're Peter Thiel. But the thing is, you're not. You're a guy who walked into a tent that says everyone in here is Peter Thiel. It doesn't make you like a, one of the masters of the universe. Well, and it trades on a very, very specific, and again, it's, it really leans on the fact that so few people have the range of expertise to, de to, to fully debunk it. it Who has the time? Who has the time to read the news, let alone like learn about every new scam or whatever, you know? Well, and so they trade on that and, and sort of take it up to the level of because you can't thoroughly debunk it, there must be something important or special or inherently true about it that you don't know. And to take it to the Theranos thing, like one of the most interesting aspects of it was that the type of sort of science she was doing literally defied the laws of physics. And many qualified scientists spoke to that effect and said, "There's this isn't the sort of thing that physically won't work, at least for the next hundred years with the kind of technology we have. But she had senators, including one who's a, an actual medical doctor who were on her board of advisors and investors. And it really speaks to this idea that not only does like the very thin patina of tech really or wellness and i think theranos really hit both of those head on allow people to sort of suspend their disbelief and feel that there must be something inherently good or worthy but also i think there's this real and it taps into the cult-like aspect of it this feeling that if you want it to be true if enough people are saying that it's true that anything can work including things that are physically impossible I mean, we just lived through a very interesting political time which i think uh, every time someone tells me that real housewives or or con artists all of this stuff is tawdry and unimportant i'm just like Guess who was president of the United States? A guy who ran a fake school and started a reality show where they built him a set that made him look like a businessman. I mean, that's essentially what televangelists were doing, too, for in the 80s, 90s, and to today, is they basically build themselves a set that, like, puts out this image that they're something that uh, can be, that is created to, like, tickle certain parts of your brain and create certain associations and create certain levels of trust. Um, but... I think the belief, the 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 belief that the just belief, is a seductive thing, and it is it is something that you should have. I mean, like it's a human impulse, but it, it, it you should believe in your family members. You should have faith in 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 certain institutions. You should learn to have trust, but. Uh, Public trust right now is at such an all-time low that anyone who even tries to create some, it's an attractive proposition. And the thing is, I think a lot of people are, are lumping in a lot of the um, the fictionalized versions of this or even the reality TV versions that are playing out with um, 
true crime exploitation, uh, which it, to a certain degree, yes, there are victims who probably don't want to be famous for being victims, but for whom the facts are being reported. But I do think that there is a net good to having people repeatedly see these stories that involve con artists, scammers, similar techniques, cults, um, because it starts to train you for signs to look for if they're well-made. And the vast majority I've seen are well-made. There was... Um, a Hulu show about wellness that was a fictionalized that Nicole Kidman starred in, which don't watch that for good information. That was like the perfect example of like things you shouldn't do. Um, but uh, I, I, I think like the dropout is instructive, should be instructive to a lot of people when it comes to cryptocurrencies. And I think we have to hope that there are a lot of people watching it who might be able to see the narrative similarities between what um, Elizabeth Holmes was doing and what these crypto people are trying to do. Um, but of course, that's not going to be everybody. And and you're not going to be able to, to teach everybody through Amanda Seyfried doing Oscar level performances. <laughs> I, you've been telling me to Just watch it. Just the best people. I think I actually might tune into it tonight. You know it's, what? It's great. It is a beautiful and it is a, it is interesting. You know, the information and in it was in the HBO doc and in the book. Um, so there's they're not breaking new ground there. But to watch it play out in real time and watch the choice, the the rationalizations people make and because the actors are doing such a good job and the scripts are really tight you can see how gradual and how easy it is and how turns of phrase can turn someone's head and also generationally like I was talking about Silicon Valley before the point that I wanted to get to and I don't think that I did <laughs> was um for a certain generation they have seen impossible things happen they have watched ma we all have magic wands in our pockets that like we wave them and food appears like that's wild to my parents that is that they never it's Star Trek. So when you tell them that someone invented a new kind of money and we're all going to be rich because of it, they're like, sure, <laughs> that sounds great. But it's not, it, it, it isn't fair because they've been told the story over and over again, especially by the media, how great Silicon Valley is or how great wellness culture is. And, and it's shoved down your throat from every angle by advertisers, by media figures, by media companies, by, I mean, even just friends and family who have had success based on it become infamous, you know? And I hope that these TV shows and the fact that um, we all have crippling addictions to television at this point post-pandemic um, might spread a little bit of awareness. My dad got super into inventing Anna, and I loved that. I was I like, love that for him. I was like, now you know. I will say, I think a huge factor in a lot of these scams, too, and a lot of the mythologizing is the total and uh, devastating collapse of expertise uh, yeah. on the internet, which has been a, a huge huge factor the past two years, especially as it pertains to public health and obviously politics and things like that. Um, and you look at like, for example, like, you know, uh, Jordan Peterson to me is one of the big all time all stars of the death of expertise in the sense that this man who is a clinical psychologist um, who has, a, you know, a very, very narrow field of, of personal expertise and most academics, most legitimate academics will go as far as they can out of their way to minimize the things that they have real expertise on and, you know, qualify their statements and make sure to really limit the scope of what they're talking about. That's why when I do video essays, I try to have facts because I don't want anyone in the comments mad at me. I exactly. want to be like, there are the facts. But, they're listed. <laughs> but the, the Peterson fans have so, and he has so widely and, you know, sort of chaotically spread around the, the breadth of things that he will speak on authoritatively. And I mean, we're talking post like, you know, being in a drug induced coma for months at a time, like in some Russian hospital. And you have him on, you know, the Joe Rogan experience, like climate is everything. So climate is nothing. <laughs> and people are still looking at that and thinking, well, because he is an academic in this one respect, the things that he's saying about this other subject, which have zero relation to his subject of expertise, must be legitimate. And you see a ton of that with these scammers. I mean, there was a lot of that uh, in the last few years with COVID too, which was like a lot of medical scams and a lot of medical quacks were coming out of the woodwork being like, you just need to be alkaline and have vitamin D, which is like not going to solve a viral infection. Um, but I think it's because right now too, part of it is, you know, you look at something like TikTok or YouTube, and these are things that I love and that have had wonderful, great effects for the world. Um, uh, but uh, you, they brought me to you. But <laughs> I will say to be further and further pigeonholed into little niches of media where like it's just a little bubble. Like there are whole TikTok phenomenons I've never heard of because I'm not the target audience and they don't really leave that bubble. And so you can find anyone on the Internet 
that with any letters next to their name to tell you anything you want because there's just so many people that you might find that one person you want to hear. But that's why I say at a certain to a certain degree, if people in good faith don't want to hear the truth, they're not going to. Right. And they emotionally, emotionally, people are broken and we have really, I'm unfortunate to say we have terrible mental health care in this country and people couldn't afford it if we had better mental health care. And so it's tough because you, 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 part of it is, is, is you're being victimized, right? You're being victimized by the system. You're being victimized by these institutions that are exploiting you. You're being victimized by the con artists themselves, but you're also, you know, going along with it a little, a little bit. Part of you right. has to, part of you has to, because we all know Google exists. We all know that we can double fact check stuff and that there is information there. But, you know, you want to believe that the fact checkers are lying to you because you really need to believe that our bond is going to make you super rich or, you know, Mary Kay is such an old company and, you know, they're so iconic. How could they be bad? So you mentioned at the beginning, kind of as a closing thought, that you have, you know, people in your life who are involved in scams, which you personally have done a fair amount of, you know, debunking on in your professional life. And my personal life. And I your personal poured life. hours into it. How can people who feel a sense of, you know, kind of hopelessness and frustration about others in their life in this respect, you know, what do you advise them for their mental health? You have to compartmentalize your love for people. And, and, and I, I have to put part that part away and say that when they're at a rock bottom, I'm not enabling them, but when they're at a rock bottom, they know that I love them and I am here to talk to them and to help them find actual financial help and maybe a real job that like is productive and, and will teach them things and get them involved in community. Like I'm here, I'm ready to help at any time. And I think people maybe don't feel a, a safety net and so you get caught into like an MLM, for example, and then your upline and your downline become your safety net. They become the closest people to you. And um, I've let them know, like, I'm not giving you any money. I don't want to hear about it. I, I have no patience for hearing about your, you know, how your crypto MLM is going to bring God or whatever. <laughs> like that whole anything, anything in, in any of those sectors, I don't have patience for. But I do have patience for the people that I love. And I know that they're that they and I've told them I know that they mean well. I know that they believe that they're right. And if ever they change their mind, I'm here for them. And and I I just make sure that the people another part of this that I think goes under discussed is the people around them. You need to inoculate people as quickly as possible. If you know that someone is super into QAnon or they're falling down um, the rabbit hole of, say, a religious organization that you think has some shady uh, financials, um, you need to go to the, you know, if it's a sibling, go to your parents. If it is uh, an aunt or an uncle, go to your other aunts and uncles, your cousins, and say, like, hey, I saw so-and-so is getting into this thing, and, you know, it, 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 they're really excited about it, and they were talking to me about it. Um, I know that that's actually a bad organization, and I sent them this info. They, they, they're they not open to hearing that right now, but I just want to make sure that you have this info in case they wanted to get you into it. And mm. you can you can create a circle around people of no, of a wall that says, like, uniformly no. And similar to addiction, you can, you can have an intervention where all these people say whatever, but you cannot control that person. You cannot make their choices for them. It, it will backfire for you. It has backfired for me so many times. What you have to do is step back and say, like, when you are ready, when you want to, let's, I'm ready to change this. You can sleep on my couch. We'll figure it out. Um, what I'm not going to give you with that is a thousand dollars for 15 intro classes or whatever and how to move things with your mind or something. So you got a YouTube channel coming out. Yes. Plug, plug, plug. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, which will be linked. Um, it is, uh, I, I'm, I'm in drag as a character named Aria woman. <laughs> oh my gosh. I didn't know that. Yes. And, um, I also have, uh, and, and, oh, I'll be doing a series on YouTube called Bad Ideas. And in every episode, I'm going to take one idea, uh, which I think is a bad idea and try to disprove it as much as I can with facts, figures, research, jokes, and drag race memes. Um, and then I am also, I'll, I'm doing a new podcast called the Academy of Drag Arts and Sciences, where we break down the queer art form of drag every week. Um, we'll talk a lot about RuPaul's Drag Race, yes, but there are other parts of drag worth discussing and people worth talking to. Um, and those are my first two projects. But please stay tuned on social to both at Ryan Houlihan and um, uh, Aria's, Aria's socials are, I have never told anyone this because I haven't, it's officially launching post filming, um, but it's at AOL keyword woman. 
I love it. You can oh find my her gosh. everywhere. And um and you can find the uh 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 at Academy of Drag as well everywhere. All of this will be linked. Uh, and as a reminder, we have our new podcast, Too Good to Be True, that will also be coming out this year that will be all about financial scams uh, with Ryan and another beloved figure in the PF community who shall be revealed to you the soon. The juice will flow. It yes. is so full of like, oh, I can't yes, wait. Yes, exactly. Well, Ryan, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. It is always a pleasure to be here. Always a pleasure. And thank you guys so much for tuning in. And I will see you guys back here next Monday on an all new episode of The Financial Confessions. Bye. Bye.